I'm recording. Okay. Welcome, everybody, <coughs> to my second talk here at the Carla 2024 about performance. Things. Uh, I hope it's fun for a Sunday morning to look at <coughs> what, what we did over the last two years regarding this. It's focusing on the HTTP, uh, the different versions. So, the question is, we have lots of tests about uh, the functionality in car. Does it work? Yes, it's good. But how does it really perform and, and what are the issues around that? And if it comes to HTTP, for example, uh, um, which HTTP do you want to use in which case? So we're having a look today at um, HTTP2 performance <coughs> over time. How that evolved, we, uh, I, I show a comparison of the different, at least of the three working H3 implementations that we have, how they compare to each other. And then at last we compare the different HTTP versions in curl and uh, what advantages and weaknesses they have compared to each other. So when I started <coughs> in curl, um, I was very happy that we had such a large test suite. Um, but what we did not have is something to measure the performance of the current implementation. And um, so I started to write a, a small Python script that fires up a server like an Apache or a Kelly server and starts to um, do some operations to get some numbers on the performance. This is like totally depending on the location you run it from and on the on your local machine you run it on so you can't really compare this it's not viable to be apply applicable in all all environments <coughs> you run curl in of course but at least it gives you a set of numbers and if you run it local on your machine you get a set of comparable numbers like for example if you compare some some things between curl 8.5 and curl 8.6 you can see do we have still the same numbers here or something changed so <coughs> that you might have an idea, have we improved the performance or have we made it worse? So the first thing the scorecard can do is measure handshake performance. And uh, if I run that on my machine in Germany where the connectivity is not as quick as on in, in Stockholm when you live there, you get a few <coughs> milliseconds. You can see like with, with some popular sites, Curl SE, Google and Cloudflare and NG HTTP2, how the TCP <coughs> connect times are and what the handshake takes compared to IP4, IP6. Um, you see that, that curl SE, which is basically Fastly front end that uh, I'm talking to here, and Cloudflare are more or less in the same ballpark a lot of times. Google is a little bit slower on the handshake, and NGHV2 is in Japan. So that's from Europe to Japan, and there you get like the TCP connect with 300 milliseconds. So you can get a little coverage of what not only the very fast connects, but also the, the slower ones, how they, how they behave. Um, and we use that also to, to look at, uh, we had one issue that <coughs> reported that our handshake, TLS handshake timing was, was has gotten slower in something and we use this to, to measure it and see <coughs> what, how to improve it. Another thing you can do on the call scorecard that's then with the local server, <coughs> in this case in the Apache, uh, how many requests can I do on a single connection per second? So <coughs> we just fire up 5,000 requests retrieving a 10 kilobyte large resource and we use this uh, one request at a time this is like the command line you see, uh, dash r for requests, <coughs> dash dash HTTP, we use the HTTP to, to test against, h2 use the HTTP2 protocol implementation. <coughs> so <coughs> we uh, measure the 5,000 requests and what we get per second when you do one request at a time, or since this is HTTP2, six requests at a time on the same connection, or 25, 50, 100, how that measures up. Uh, what you get is it is it plateauing somewhere or, or is it breaking down so we can see that again this is just on a local machine on a local server 
I mean, this machine that I run, this one has enough cores so that the running server and client, but since kernel only uses a single core, and the server doesn't use all the 19 others, it's pretty without interference. But <coughs> of course, you, that will vary uh, with the machine you use. And this is uh, this core catch script is checked into the kernel source, so you can run this yourself on, at, at home, so to say. Um, the other thing is <coughs> that you can measure with dash D is the download speed, the transfer rate, throughput. And uh, it varies here. You can control that by the command line as well. It usually uses like 1 MB resources, 10 and 100, to see like what's the effect if you have more content and the connection is hotter, so to say, and uh, what do you get then? And it does the similar stuff. It does a, a single transfer, like just like one resource, <coughs> or it <coughs> takes uh, 50 times one after the other, or it runs 50 in parallel. And that's then the, the transfer rates that uh, I get on my machine on 8.8.0 dev version with HTTP 1. So in HTTP 1, of course, it for the parallel tests, it takes at really 50 TCP connections. Right. There we have Daniel again. Um, yeah, so that's just one way to measure it. It might not be the best way. Uh, um, but at least it gives us something. Um, the question with this kind of benchmarking is of course like all benchmarks lie and they never apply everywhere. Um, how can we automate this that we have some kind of indicator if we change curl, like this is going down 25%, like what, what's happening here, what did we change? That doesn't break any functionality in the test, but that breaks has impact on performance or significantly, and that's a bit tricky to set up. And we haven't done that really um, because it's tricky to get the baseline. And, and other things might have changed on the machine. You might have updated your kernel, and suddenly numbers are a little bit different. So um, it's not that easy to do that. But at least we can do this like <coughs> on, the, on the major releases or like every other week manually and see like okay this all looks like pretty much than before. Uh, I, I think it's a good good idea. Uh, have you considered using like um, in Python you you have locus for example? I think we, you can have the runner not use the Python request library. You can use curl just like curl invoke, and then you get all the goodness of the you know it generates a lot of uh, good data interesting graphs and all that type of stuff. Okay. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, take a look at that, um, because it might be better than you cutting some cloth. It, it's very nice what you're doing, but you might just plug into a bunch of libraries that already exist for for this kind of okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. But I'm running the core client, right? So I'm not... Sure, sure. You can use, with Locus, you can insert what the... the um, the command the invoke will be so okay. uh, by default. I think Locus probably uses uh, Python request, but you can replace that with. Okay, I'll you I can have a look. Yeah. Locus. There's also a Rust version of Locus, which is very interesting as well. But you know. Okay, <laughs> ah, good idea. <coughs> and these are all gets here. The downloads are all gets. Yeah. We have so far not measured upload performance. And it's H1, and there's no, no like this one. This is H1, yes. Yeah. So it's like uh, the the right column is like 50 TCP connections. It's all HTTPS, <coughs> by the way. All right. Thanks. So <coughs> on a, on when curl runs single core, that's probably the most limiting factor if everything else is implemented correctly. Yeah, it's quite significant uh, limiting, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, three times or something. I mean, and doing it without TLS is so much faster. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, the server can can send also much faster, of course. And yeah, yeah. But so this is my machine. On, on, on Daniel's machine, you get about good two twice the throughput. Yeah, I think that much. Yeah. <coughs> so I looked when I wrote this. I looked at curl seven eight seven, the one before the. Connection filters. <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry, the very um, complete connection filter. What? The innocent days. The innocent <laughs> days, yes. And, huh, 
what is happening here? HTTP2, when you do a single transfer, you get like 260 or 300 in the Apache case. That goes up if we do one transfer after the other because everyone gets really in the mood. <coughs> and if you do the parallel one, we go down to what? To almost the number of a single transfer. So much slower than if you do the one transfer one after the other. So I said, like, what's going on here? Something is wrong. This should not be. If you do, and this is HTTP2, right? If you do <coughs> HTTP2 and start several transfers, the server will send you the response back in frames, and it is free to mix the frames on the TCP connection, like how it thinks it suits best. There are some flow control window sizes involved. You could possibly juggle with H2 priorities to influence this, but basically the server is not obliged to <coughs> to um, to anything you you want. It can do it like it feels like, which means usually you get if you have parallel transfers, like you say, you have like a red stream, an orange stream, a blue stream. Uh, you get frames or d data packets for these streams, like one after the other, intermixed. However. The server thinks it's best. <coughs> and servers do it really differently. So here we'll have like the train coming in from the, with the response data from the server. It has like three red containers for, let's say that's the first stream, and then it's a, an orange one for the second, and then there are some blues for the third. More orange, some red, some blue, and then two whites for, I don't know, stream four or five or whatever it is. And <coughs> Curl needs to offload this train from the from the head to the end, one container after the other, and process the response. That's basically the analogy we, we look at here. So <coughs> what we have then uh, in 787 was that we had offloaders for the streams, like an offloader for the white stream, for the red, for the orange, and for the blue stream. <coughs> and when data was coming in on the socket, we called started like for example one of these and said like start offloading the train and that could have been the white one for example and the white offloader would go to the head of the train and said like there's no white container here that's the red one i can't offload the red container that's not for me stop the train i return and report that nothing no progress could be done here so the train is stopped <coughs> and then curl <coughs> starts the red offloader and the red offloader said okay I can offload three of the, the, the first three reds, but then it's an orange. I can't offload the orange. We stop the train again. Hopefully, then curl runs the orange offloader to <laughs> offload another container, but it might also be a, the blue one, which, which will then say, like, I can't do anything. So there was a lot of going back and forth with the different offloaders um, because no one had an idea what really to be done, what's the first priority here. So everyone was very busy, Carl was 100% CPU, so it was doing something all the time, but the train was not really getting offloaded. When you had just a single transfer, all containers are the same color, and you have just a single offloader, so the train doesn't have to stop. And that's why the <coughs> transfers, the serial, one after the other, had a good performance, Right, like a gigabyte, and the one where the, the containers become mixed on the train was just going down because everyone was busy going back and forth and finding out that they could not really progress. The right, and the process. difference between Apache and Caddy was due to the different framing then, right? Yeah, Apache and Caddy have different ideas, like how many frames or uh, how many aspects to speak to my uh, stick to my image, how many containers of the same color color they send, or how m often they also <coughs> the color. So, um, and that has then influence how, how often the <coughs> offloaders need to go back and forth. So, what we did then <coughs> in 7.8.8 was we uh, had some temporary storage on the side of the track, so to say, where we could put a container of the wrong color, or maybe two. It was a small space, 
but we had that, so we <coughs> taught the offloaders, if you have a container of the wrong color, and in the temp space there's enough room, you don't have to, to stop the train, you just put it there. And if in the stem store is something for you, you first pick it up from, from there. And <coughs> so we needed to stop this train less, and then some time later in call 8.1, we extended this uh, to not have this limited temp space and really have a, a buffer there that can grow. Um, so we could offload the wrong colored containers into their buffers and then also uh, use them from there. So we never needed to stop the train in this version. I started. Uh, to measure, so you have on the on the left one, you have the 787 version, mm -hmm. which had then on these parallel transfers 50 times 100 MB megabytes uh, resources. Uh, you had like the throughput of about 400 megabytes per second. Um, for both, the green one is the Apache server, and the dark blue one, the squares, is the Caddy server. And then we had 7881 where we had this temporary space to, to put something. And you saw like <coughs> the Apache jumped very much up, the Caddy also, but not as much. And that's the difference in the uh, order of containers, like how many of the same color. If there were too many of the same of the same wrong color, the temp space was not sufficient. We needed to stop the train again, and that was impacting the caddy performance. Apache is, is, is uh, uh, changing colors more, more often than, uh, than Caddy, so the temp space was more often sufficiently large, right? So <coughs> we needed to, to stop the train less. In 8.1.1, we introduced the, the rear buffer, which could grow. Yeah. That improved the Caddy performance, so we went through 900 something megabytes. And it lessened the Apache performance a little bit, because <coughs> the buffering involved some overhead, which uh, uh, it was having a little impact, but we said, well, okay, that's, that's okay. And then we uh, didn't look at these things for a while, admittedly. And uh, sometime later, a uh, month later, I looked at the performance in, um, I don't know, 8.5 or something. And I discovered that the performance had gone down again, and we did hadn't no. even changed anything uh, in this code. Yes, yes. We changed the buffering, right? Yeah. What we changed is so the question is, what happened here? And I then noticed that during these runs, it could happen that the core process memory was significantly growing. So what I started to add to our scorecard that it uses PSUtil in Python yeah. to <coughs> monitor the process CPU use and uh, memory use. Uh, since I wanted to have this portable, the memory use is the RSS size, uh, which is still a good indicator. And what we found out in, in the case um, that concerns <coughs> us, this 550 transfers is, that if you see, look on the right, curl's memory use rises to 250 or 330 megabytes, which is, oops. That's something we do not want. So what happened was, in the case is, if you take this train image again, if you send off the white offloader, it will put all the ones before, all the containers before the white ones into the buffer storage, right? And that was working. Then it finds the white one and says, okay, I found one, I return. What we changed then in curl was we were more greedy. We said, like, we, we told the offloader, do not fetch us one container, fetch us three. We would like to have more data. So if you take this train and tell the offloader to, to get three white containers, which are not really there, it will offload the whole train into the buffers. And that's what our memory use was. So when you, this measurement picture, I, I added the, the memory consum uh, uh, 
consumption. You see, like in seven eight seven, we were like eleven and twelve megabytes. With the tame storage, it was also like just a little bit more, and then the non greedy version used like also varying between Kelly and Apache, like 140 or 63, which might have been acceptable. And then the greedy version really put too much stuff into the buffers. So what we do after that <coughs> in 8.7, we rewrote the whole offloading stuff. Um, we made the offloader able to process any color, really. And for that, we had to change um, how transfer responses are processed. Um, so far, that was like the transfer loop was pulling from the connections and then pushing this to the client, so the application, the color command line tool or another color application. Here's the response data. <coughs> and we changed that. that um, the offloaders themselves could push to the client. This is like the change you see on the left. This CW stands for a client writer. That's a chain of writers, a stack of writers, similar to the connection filters. Um, similar design pattern, <coughs> where we have a configurable chain that processes the response data, and in the end calls the client call base for the received call. Um, so the offloader is now able to just get the container and push it into the <coughs> into the writer queue of, of the correct color. So we do not have any buffer there anymore. We can directly process the response data we get from H2, uh, push it out, and then we get this picture. So we are for memory use. We are back to where we started. From performance, we are like, in the Apache case, like three times the performance. Uh, in a, for Kelly, it's like two and a half factor. And, and what, uh, sorry, I'm interrupting. What's interesting is that this is <laughs> it's basically not driven by user reports, right? This is mostly you working on this. I, I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's curious that very rarely that people actually report a performance problem, right? It's uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's very slow over here. No one, no one said that. Now it's three times faster, and basically no one has told us that. It's, it's Someone has pointed out <coughs> a few of these things, but sort of it's usually these things go go under the radar. Yeah, it's like. Uh, I mean, first of all, this is like on localhost. With you, you can get as much throughput as the TLS decryption is allowing you to uh, to do so like you get like what is your peak on your machine like two two and a half gigabytes or 2.7 gigabytes per second on this machine it's like with this one connection it's, it's one or two or one or three <coughs> if you have a real connection to a server somewhere on the internet you probably do not have that fast <coughs> your your internet connection itself will be the limit in many cases or the server is not as responsive. So how would you, as a user, how would you see that that is slow? I mean, compare maybe if you if you use localhost, then it might be, or a local machine somewhere on your own network, and it will uh, might be noticeable. If you go a uh, transfer over the internet, you might probably not see it. Or if you see a local low slower transfer, you might probably blame the server being slow today or something like that. Or the network. Yeah, or the network being congested, or yep. your stupid ISP is messing <laughs> things up again. Or so it's it's. Uh, I think for the user, it's hard to track down. Yep. <coughs> no, I'm not gonna. As I've interrupted, Kishal has a question from RSD. I'm not sure if you want the question now or at the end. But the question is about RFCs. These different frames are part of RFC nine one thirteen, correct? Wondering with RFC to read to learn more. About how the frames are sent, the HTTP two RFC is nine one one three. Yeah, I think yeah, but they're off by one. So yeah, I think yeah. nine one three nine is HTTP two, which describes like the framing layer and protocol. And um, it's basically the same for H three as well, even if yeah, on compli the more complicated. Yeah. yeah. 
So they, they, they describe the framing and how the response is and, and IH2 has flow control, of course, also every stream is under flow, flow control, so you need to have acknowledgements going back and forth and so on. Um, yeah, with that we were very happy, so I think we now have a good grip on the situation. We, we have like no memory additional, we can basically pump up more parallel transfer without really much impact on the on the curl uh, application or the hosting application and we get uh, as good throughput as we can do here with uh, running on single threaded one would imagine that if you would have gone even further i mean more connections more streams <coughs> would have been an even bigger difference yeah probably because we have now less administrative overhead Pro exactly that yeah, yeah. So that just sums up. So if you m go into performance, and you all know this, there are just factors in there which are multiplicative. Uh, so you have a little bit here, and then it blows up over there. Uh, memory hotness is a vital thing. Like the, it's not, in my experience, the the people often focus on zero copy things. Uh, like never copying data somewhere else <coughs> to have the best performance. And that is true, but <coughs> what is more important is like the amount of memory you use. If you have like large buffers, they will destroy your CPU caches yeah. if you process them. If you have small buffers, you can copy many times before it has really, really impact. As long as it just stays in the in the <coughs> CPU cache, um, then it doesn't cost very much if you if you stay in there. But if you have large amount of memory, your cache will just constantly swap out each other and, and that will have a hot impact on this. Yeah, and you need to continuously look at, at monitor what, what's going on there. Um, <coughs> that was H2. H3. We have basically three working uh, backends for H3. We have a fourth one, MSPIC, which I would say is not usable in its current state. So what we have is NGTCP2 with the NGHTTP3 library, NGTCP2 doing the quick protocol, and NGHTTP3 just the H3 layer on top of the quick protocol. We have Kish, who does it all in one, and we have OpenSL <coughs> quick since OpenSL 3.2. <coughs> which on top of it uses then the NGHTTP3 library for the H3 itself, framing, header compression, and stuff like that. So if we <coughs> compare also with the scorecard thing, request per second, on a local host we use Caddy because Apache doesn't have H3 or quick support. Uh, we get like the following numbers. <coughs> we see that the, the dark and light blue ones, that's uh, NGTSP2 and Kish, are about at the same level. <coughs> and we see that OpenSSL Quick is for single uh, transfers uh, like 75% maybe, uh, and for parallel transfers it's it's half the performance you get out of the other ones. If you look at uh, download throughput, if we do large, small resort, uh, uh, small transfers, it's they are all basically the same. If you do larger ones, you see the difference. Um, there are 50 requests in parallel here, and you see that <coughs> the NGTCP2 and Kish are like scaling up, giving more performance with more more parallel transfers, and the OpenSSL Quick is flattening out pretty pretty soon. So also roughly, I think, if, you, if you're interested in parallel transfers or parallel requests, it's about half what you get with OpenSSL Quick compared to the others. Uh, what do I have here? Yeah. So <coughs> that's the rea reality of the current implementation. We have talked to the OpenSSL project regarding what we perceive as the, the things missing in their API or as things that do not work well for us. and. Um, they fixed some things we reported, but the main problem is um, 
that <coughs> we do not get enough information about this dream flow control state. Um, <coughs> Perl has to monitor the connection uh, sockets for polling. And in order to do that, it has to know, am I waiting for incoming data? Am I waiting to be able to write data out? And for the OpenSSL transfers, we often do not know if the transfer, even if the socket may be writable, if the transfer is really able to write because of the flow control that is in Quick. So we don't have that information. Um, and what OpenSSL has proposed as a solution to us so far doesn't really solve the problem for us. Because Curl has many transfers, OpenSSL Quick might just be one or, or half of the transfers that are ongoing. <coughs> we cannot give the control to OpenSSL. And I think that's OpenSSL idea is how a client should work. I think their idea is like the client sets up all these quick transfers and then and sets them to OpenSSL, manage it please. And that's not working in the curl uh, situation where curl needs to do other things as well in the same area. So <coughs> it's a little bit of a stall. I don't expect to a 3.3 release <coughs> in April fix some small issues and get make some improvements. The one, I think, 3.4 is then for autumn somewhere. Um, so far, I have no indication that any thing improvement for us will be in there. So I think <coughs> for, um, for this year, I do not see that we need the experimental stages for the open and sell quick uh, backend here. Because it, we, we would consider it not, not good enough. Do we have an indication that that the reason for the worst performance, or is it just? Is, do we know? There are for this. I mean, definitely, what I just described <coughs> is the, the the overall worst impact is if we do uploads that we have a hundred percent CPU. Right, resume. we have to loop a lot of silly loops. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we spend a lot of CPU time, but and of course that for the downloads, yeah. the problem is that. Um, where we have callback APIs in NGTCP2 and Fish. So when something happens on the stream, we get a callback invoked and we know exactly then which of the transfer needs what to do. Uh, the OpenSSL Quick API, we uh, can only iterate over all streams and ask like, is there something to do here? Or is, is, this, is this their data and blah, blah. So we constantly iterate over all the streams to find out what's going on. And this, of course, is inefficient. Right. Uh, it will just degrade even more streams. It will just be even slower. Yeah. So if I would expect, like, if you if you do even more parallel transfers, the, the differences will be great. Yeah. <coughs> so I, you could say, like, okay, but <coughs> maybe people are happy with this transfer for uh, using it, but the, the CPU busy loop is not acceptable, I would say. Will not use the full slot. Ooh, <laughs> bonus points. Can you do something else? <laughs> um, comparing H123, uh, what should you use? Does it really matter? The usual answer like it depends. If you just look at, at the handshake performance, uh, H3 is better than the other ones. Basically, you, you uh, save a turnaround, you save the TCP initial one. You quick will send the UDP packet with the TLS client hello just in one go, and we get the response back from the server and then finish the handshake more or less. And uh, you, in the other cases, you have first the TCP connection set up, and then the handshake will start, and so it just takes longer. <coughs> Depending, of course, on the on the latency you have to your server. What is Google doing? <laughs> I don't know. Th that's a good question. I mean, like, since they tend to be very yeah, on these things. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, 
Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I, I was <laughs> like, I was the yeah. same. I was like saying, ah. Next door. Since then, they were roughly on the same distance from you, right? So from Curl and Cloud Fred, they're roughly the same. Yeah, should round trip should yeah. be. I mean, if you measure it here or at home, I mean, you might see other numbers. It, it might be another oh. uh, cloud uh, instance that you're talking to, or I don't know if they have. I don't know what they do. Fascinating. I also think it's fascinating that the IPv6 is slightly slower. German internet. Yeah. Mm. But IP6 on German internet is in German telecom is not so bad because the guy who used to work there in the routing, I, I worked with him for some time. He was actually an old internet guy. <coughs> So, and if you look at download, <laughs> you can see this picture. That's a, a test with the caddy. Um, the dark green one is H1, the light green one is H2, and the others are the different quick backends. Like the dark blue one is OpenSSL, uh, the light blue one is NGTCP2, and the uh, dark green or whatever it is, is Kish. And if you do it like that, it's like uh, the 50 times 100 megabyte retrieving in parallel on a local machine where you can get um, these numbers with the caddy server, uh, which we saw earlier also when we talked about H2. And this is what you get with Quick. So if you want to do, uh, if you have a very good connection to your server and you want to transfer lots of data, Quick is probably not such a good idea. <laughs> and the main problem is <coughs> with Quick is that it's just very costly, the encryption. I mean, people often say like, yeah, but UDP is not as optimized in the kernel as TCP and so on, which is true, but this is the measurement on localhost and, and there's really no device offloading. As far as I understand, the whole thing uh, really involved. And um, the main thing is, I mean, in all these transfers, curl runs at 100% CPU, right? Um, so it's not waiting on any quick data to come or so because the server is lazy. It's, uh, it's processing as hard as it could. And the UDP packets are like 1,200 bytes as an encrypted thing. And uh, it's... As to my understanding, it's just much more costly to process these short encrypted stuff than having like a TCP 16K record. And that <coughs> has certainly impact here. So if you want to have a small requests, like we saw the handshake is very fast on the new connection, Quick might be uh, very good for you because you, you certainly save, save time there. If you want to do transfers and have a fast connection, you should probably stick to H1 or H2. That would be my advice. Highly subjective. Of course, this can vary in any environment a little bit, and you have to make up your mind yourself what works for you, but this would be my general guideline. To me, performance is important. It's, it's fun to, to have something that really gets your hardware glowing. Um, efficiently, not just in a busy loop, uh, and <coughs> for me it's always fun to look at this and, and improve it and make it better. It's, it's part of, I mean, we, we let computers do stuff because they're faster than we doing with the hand, right? So it should be as fast as you can. <coughs> we need to measure and compare in the future stuff, maybe add something for us also on the upload case, and um, yeah. That's basically what I had to tell about the performance development in mm -hmm. Curl in recent years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I have a few questions. Sure. Um, one is, uh, I get it'd be great to I can see a CI job running all this stuff. Have you considered maybe putting these tests in an, uh, in an environment you control the CPU and, and RAM, so maybe in a container? I want Daniel to run it. Of course. <laughs> on his machine. 
That, that, uh, we could have a distributed uh, you know, uh, network of people running it around the world. And he just well. wants the fastest possible machine to run it. So yeah, 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 sure. Okay. <laughs> um, but you know, on CI, you'd want to pin the parameters of the uh, environment. Uh, you, you can do that with, with Container Edge. You, know, you can give it so much RAM and so much this yeah, and that but whatever. Not, I mean, the CI platforms that we so far use won't allow us to control the CPU allocations. Oh, no, no, you can do it by running a container, and then you run the tests inside of that container. You can control the, 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 the container that you spawn. Um, you can just use Docker to, do, to control the memory and the CPU. So, but I would run the container somewhere which I control. I no, no, you can you can spawn a container as in a GitHub, in a GitHub, GitHub action? action job, and then that container running, you you run your test inside a controlled. It's like a FreeBSD jail job, <coughs> locked down. Okay. Uh, so that would give you sane everywhere, in theory, uh, because you could say, uh, you know, it's not got maximum RAM or you know that might be a more valid sort of. CI regular test. But how do I avoid that this container runs on the same node with 100 others? That might be a feature, yeah? Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I think absolutes here don't matter much. I think it's Okay, if I just do relative performance numbers. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, think I, see, I, see. And, and I think that's a good regression test, because yeah. if you change relative-wise, then yeah. something's changed. Right, right, but then you have to do the relative tests and hope that they don't change while you're running them, right? Yeah. And possibly check out <coughs> an old one and do the new one and hope that they run roughly at the same. Sure, so there's there's entropy here. Uh -huh. I don't think I think there's a fuzziness to the, these kind of tests just by its nature, but I think that's how like we've approached it, it to, to get a common environment. Um, yeah. You could consider it. Some CI hosts uh, do better than, than others for uh, overloading machines. So you choose one that seems to give you an actual yeah. and you could do them self-hosted runners too that could so you could work on making them yeah. less uh, flaky or, or more stable so there are ways to work on it so just I think it's mostly a matter of someone needs to do it <laughs> as, as, usual. as usual as usual I might be interested in that I might, might ping you on IRC for maybe yeah. setting up a CI yeah. job yeah. it's interesting I've done it before where I'm working now so we've done we do these kind of sort of performance regression tests which you know if they, when they fail that would be great yeah, that's something we know that would be great I mean there's something we've been missing forever right so we don't notice when we do regressions and these are just one set of right. performance yeah, tests yeah, we yeah. could I mean there are a bazillion more we could do because we've had other performance regressions in other parts that we just don't notice because mm -hmm. we Really don't ever care about it. Well, you get you get the problem of scale here. You know, there's a lot of different invokes of of, of uh, HTTP conversation. You know, and all the other right, but uh, and also all other parts of the of the yeah. library. I mean, we've done stupid things in the past that just turned out that it didn't really scale. We didn't really think about it. No one tested it, and suddenly some user just threw some new use case on it and suddenly we realized that wait a minute that was a stupid act but because now mm -hmm. suddenly it didn't scale at all and it just mm -hmm. turned it into mm -hmm. mud it runs once well in the test exactly because we don't notice uh, it in our test because we don't run it right in yeah. Yeah. it doesn't run at all yeah i mean for example like uh, how good is curl at processing and these are all examples of 50 concurrent transfers on the same connection like how good is it with 100 or 200 or 500 is there anything noticeable going on there? You well, can expand that in several dimensions and, and, and directions to yeah. have some number. I'm glad you've done this because in the fuzz testing, I, I, and I've done previous <coughs> versions, and I couldn't tell why the hell did 8 point, I can't remember the version two. Yeah. But it was like, th this is using a huge amount more RAM. I'm, yeah, glad, yeah, that's, yeah. I'm glad that's fixed. <laughs> 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 they want to report this because it was really bad. But yeah, I was just looking at my, my activity monitor and so I saw a curl running and said, what, 500 megabytes? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> and again, amusing that no one else saw this uh, because it's, yeah, it was crazy memory consumption. I guess it's also a fairly unusual use case. But performance is indicative of um, like a problem maybe in design as well. Like uh, my second question was, y we went through a few iterations, right? Yeah. And now we're on the final design. Do you feel like that design is the right design, or is that an optimization design that is obfuscated? 
No, I think it's <coughs> a bad design. Um, I, I didn't cover this due to time restriction in the uh, yesterday in the presentation. The client writers, and we have also client readers, are they existed in a in a previous date a little bit already um, from I think Patrick Monroe, David Rose. Yes. Um, we need to do an HTML. We need to do content decoding. Like the server can set us something compressed, like bro broadly compressed, for example. And if the client doesn't want get to get it as it is, we we have to decompress it. Also, like if the server uses HTTP one chunk encoding, we need to. So the response has several uh, stages in which it needs to pr be processed. And <coughs> what we had before specialized for HTTP, we have now converted into a general thing for all protocols and transfers. So we have this writer stack with the standard writers, for example, uh, that debug log the raw bytes, for example, then, then automatically for all protocols, it's, it's there. I mean, they don't have to care about this, it's just installed in the writer chain. We have the uh, protocol, the, the stuff uh, monitoring the, the content length and updating the progress meters. Uh, and the last one is the one who uses the, the write function callbacks to the client to, to de deliver the real data and handle the pausing of transfers also. And <coughs> so we have this now in a standard interface for all protocols to use. And for the protocols, it becomes uh, uh, easier also because um, before we had like these cases, yeah, if some content encoding is involved, use this kind of write in the response, otherwise use that kind. And this is all the way, we have a standard way to do this. And <coughs> as the H2 case proves is we can then do things without buffering somewhere else, which is just directly write it to the client. That had impact on the client because <coughs> we have one report. Um, of course, we now directly write the data to the client, which means the client sees now suddenly 16K frames from H2 as write. Before, we had like a buffering, so you usually got like <coughs> 64 or 100 Ks at a jump. And clients see that. And there was one guy reporting on that. And uh, I think the client in general should be prepared for that. If they really need buffering in their callback handlers, um, maybe in the future we could add some option in curl to, to support this, or they should handle it on their own because they probably know best how to do this. Uh, it should not just be uh, the luck that curl calls with the right amount of data. Right. No, I, I think they, they, I don't think we need to fix that really, but I think we have other things to fix performance wise so that we <coughs> could reduce the number of received calls. Yeah. But that's on the socket really exactly in this case. And um, so I think this was a good change because it reduced code lines in the in, in protocol handlers in general. So I think it fits. Um, for H2, it was directly very beneficial. It's also beneficial in H3's case, um, where the same problem arises, basically. And uh, also, just to go back to the question, is this the final uh, version? There's, there's never a final version. <laughs> but, but this approach was at least pretty much what Stefan wanted to do already from the beginning when we were starting to talking about you know, when, I, when he started to look at the H2 code and how, how on earth is this actually working? Because, you know, getting H, the H2 supporting the curl in the first place, that was, you know, I, I think Stefan can agree with me since he did the H Apache thing there, that H2 introduces sort of a revolution in, in HTTP land, right? Because yeah. suddenly connections and transfers were not the same thing anymore. Mm -hmm. You did many transfers over the same connection. You never did that before. So suddenly everything, all the assumptions, all the paradigms were completely out the window, right? So, mm -hmm. so we had to squeeze that into the API for libcurl. How do we actually handle that? Yeah. So in, in the libcurl uh, world, it drives each transfer is a transfer and it, uh, each transfer owns a connection right or it used to because now suddenly many transfers have the same connection but it we still have the transfers and the transfer is who's polling the connection and that's the the different container pollers that it was uh, Stefan talked about so that made it into a complicated solution just based because we did that h1 h2 transition and i think we got stuck in that's weird or left it like that because it worked. But as Stefan 
came there and said we shouldn't do it. We should do just feed the data immediately without putting it into weird in yeah, between it caches or it was a very complicated implementation i was uh, for a time was struggling to get this right like uh, um, stopping the train and and doing the stuff uh, uh, buffering the right and then giving the right drain signals and so on and i was like daniel could it be that we basically write this to the callback in the end um, why aren't we doing this directly <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There were some things in the way to, to clean up, uh, of course, because that's that's the history. If you start with HTTP unencrypted, you, you just have a buffer, you read from the socket and, and forward it to the client. I mean, that's how it works, right? And also, what, what you didn't get, get into here, which was not relevant, of course, is that when, when Stefan started, we had a single download buffer per transfer, uh, per, per handle. And uh, we don't even have that anymore. So nowadays we don't even have, and previously we would, uh, for example, with the lib, with the curl command line, we would allocate 100K per transfer. If, so if you did 100 transfers in parallel, that would be 100K per transfer. But now we don't even do that. Now we just have one, yeah. one <coughs> buffer per, yeah, per session, really. So we have a huge memory saving mm -hmm. in, in that mm -hmm. regard, too. Uh, it's interesting. Polarity pulling and pushing generates mm -hmm. code around it. Uh, and often, whenever you change the direction, you have to change a lot of code around it. I, I think it's the right design. But easier to maintain, more generic, and simpler to understand. Yeah, for example, we could then, uh, in, in the WebSockets case, which has its own framing over the HTTP uh, uh, request response, for example, we could just add another writer which does the decoding of the frames mm -hmm. at for the protocol. So the whole transfer loop was no longer really impacted by running a WebSocket connection. And these kind of things, I think, prove that, that this is a good design because it seems to fit the protocols we have so far. It could be that we have another protocol uh, next year that has unique requirements where this doesn't fit. It might be so you can never say this is the final <laughs> design, so to say. Or if you do this datagram stuff, who knows? Um, <coughs> but it seems to fit the, the current needs of Perl quite well, I think. So, single threading? Hmm? Oh, that's polite. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 